Hello, this is the AI Lab. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Bertin Martens, a senior fellow at Bruegel and non-resident research fellow at the Tilburg Law and Economic Center at Tilburg University. He has been working on digital economy issues as senior economist at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission for more than a decade until April 2022. Prior to that, he was Deputy Chief Economist for Trade Policy at the European Commission. The reason? A working paper written by Burton for the Bruegel Think Tank on the economic arguments in favor of reducing copyright protection for generative AI inputs and outputs. Let's hear what Bertin has to say. In your report, you argue that the AI Act and the right for copyright holders to opt out of free text and data mining may lead to um, economically inefficient overprotection of copyright. Now, could you elaborate on why you believe this opt-out could hinder innovation and economic growth and how this right affects the bargaining power of copyright holders compared to the potential benefits of generative AI for society? Thank you, Carolyn, for this question. Um, in my view, copyright is an economic policy tool to stimulate investment in the production of artwork. And granting an exclusive copyright to an author avoids free writing on that artwork that would undermine the incentives to invest in the, its production. So from an economic perspective, giving exclusive monopolistic right is in principle not efficient. However, the optimal scope of copyright protection should balance, on the one hand, the welfare losses from this exclusive right given to an author against the welfare gains for society from stimulating investment in new and innovative productions. In this perspective, both overprotection and underprotection are bad. They will hamper innovation and reduce the economic efficiency of copyright. So let's assume that before the arrival of generative AI technology, copyright was broadly in balance between those two components. Now, with the arrival of generative AI as a new production technology for artwork, this balance is upset and we need to correct it again. So Generative AI opens up new and much cheaper possibilities to produce new and innovative artwork and also has applications in a wide variety of other sectors outside the media sector and across the economy and, and allows the beneficial production of, of new services in, in many different fields. At the same time, it reduces the cost also of producing artwork in the media sector. And so the combination of these two changes provides arguments to reduce the scope of copyright protection in media industries in order not to slow down innovation, both in the media industry that uses these generative AI models, but also, and perhaps more importantly, in the rest of the economy, um, where these generative AI models are applied in many different settings. Now, in Europe, Copyright is not just an economic policy tool, but it's also a fundamental right for authors to receive a remuneration for their artwork. And reducing the scope of copyright protection and thus of remuneration is perceived as a weakening of that fundamental right. And this fundamental rights approach complicates bringing technological change into the copyright debate. And this fundamental right stance is reflected in the EU AI Act. It allows copyright holders to opt out and prohibit the use of their content for AI model training, unless the model developer pays them a license fee. And that opt out puts the private interest of copyright holders in control of the wider interest of society. And that benefits the use of generative AI models in many tasks and services across the economy. So the AI Act and the copyright law in Europe give priority to the private interest of copyright holders over the wider interest of society. And I don't think that's a good thing and we should change that. 
Thank you. That that was very clear. Um, and, and thank you for assuming there was a balance before, by the way. Yeah. Um, so you also mentioned that the, the licensing of training inputs for generative AI could reduce uh, the quality and the competitiveness of generative AI models, which in turn could impact productivity gains across various sectors. Could you explain the implications of this for the generative AI ecosystem, especially regarding competition between firms and the potential economic disadvantage for European AI developers? So generative AI models require a vast amount of training data to develop the model and to have a high quality model. And already today, we observe that the largest and most advanced models are running out of high quality human edited text for model training. There is still sufficient supply of low quality text data, for instance, from social media or from the transposition of voice data into text or even from synthetic data. But all these low quality sources reduce the quality of generative AI models. They become less accurate, they give, they hallucinate more and they provide uh, lower quality responses to the questions that you ask them. So imposing copyright licensing requirement on text data for model training will even further shrink the available supply of text data for model training. And that will further reduce the quality of these models. So the licensing revenue may be beneficial for private copyright holders, but it reduces the quality of AI models in general for society and for everyone who uses these models. Moreover, we already observe that only the biggest tech companies can actually afford to negotiate the licensing fees and pay those licensing fees to copyright holders. We see that companies like Google uh, are start, have negotiated and are negotiating with uh, copyright holders. And uh, recently, only yesterday, I read that the, uh, Google's YouTube uh, started talks with copyright holders. Uh, Microsoft uh, is in talks with copyright holders, has signed agreements. OpenAI has signed agreements and so on. But these are the big fellows, the big companies that have deep pockets and can afford to pay for them. And these negotiations are driven by fear of punitive statutory copyright damages under US copyright law. In Europe, we don't see those negotiations taking place, not yet at least. Smaller AI startups cannot afford this. And we see that they are pushed out of the market, either they simply try to hold on without signing copyright agreements. And we'll see how long that goes until the AI Act really kicks into action. And pushing smaller AI startups out of the market is bad for competition, bad for innovation in the AI setting. And this is not the way we want to go, I think. So um i think this whole copyright setup at the moment is bad for the quality of the models bad for competition bad for innovation so towards the end of your report you discuss the fact that there is no need for copyright on generative ai outputs due to the near zero marginal cost of machine production H how do you see this this new uh, reality impacting the creative industries and the broader economy? And what are your thoughts on how policy should evolve to reflect these technological changes? Yeah, thanks for bringing up this issue because so far I spoke about copyright on the input side of uh, generative AI model. Let's also now talk a bit about the output side. So generally, Copyright law worldwide, I think, grants copyright only to human authors of artwork, not to machine produced artwork. There are some minor exceptions to that rule, but in general, I think this is true. And that rule was not a problem until recently because only machines could produce artwork. With the arrival of generative AI models, however, that has changed. And for the first time in human history, a machine can produce artwork output. 
And so now legal scholars are debating whether copyright should also be granted to machine produced, generative AI produced uh, artwork and outputs. Uh, leaving aside the legal debate, uh, as an economist, I focus on this from an economic perspective. And I argue that from an economic perspective, there is no need to grant copyright to AI produced art artwork. And that is because the marginal cost of producing a generative AI output is actually very close to zero. It's hugely costly to train the models and set them up, but once they are trained, uh, the marginal cost of using them is very low. And what may be costly, however, is the human labor that goes into designing for a prompt set, a prompt set that you feed into a generative AI model and that finally produces the output. It's, it's a set of text lines, like computer code, uh, that produces a painting, a piece of music, a picture, a video, and so on. And so this prompt set is human artwork and could indeed receive copyright protection, just like any other human design text or computer code. And in the US, we see that the US Copyright Registration Office already begins to implement that rule. It grants copyright protection to uh, prompt sets, but not to the outputs of that prompt set. And we also observe that uh, commercial markets are emerging for prompt sets. You can buy them and sell them on the internet and they fetch a price in that market. And that's all very nice and well because the human effort is still remunerated. But the output means you just feed that prompt set into a generative AI model. You push the button and within seconds you get your output. And so the distinction between a generative AI prompt set and a generative AI produced output based on those prompts, I think is something equivalent to what we see in music, for example, the distinction between rights for composers and the rights for performers of users, music. The composer gets copyrights on the lyrics and on the music composition. The performer gets copyright on his actual performance of that composition. But if a machine does the performance and can do that at near zero cost, there is no need for copyright protection on, on that output. Uh, legal scholars, of course, will say that there is no need for copyright protection because the performance was done by a machine. As an economist, I would say that there is no need for copyright protection for that performance because the marginal cost is so low and the risk of free riding, therefore, is very limited. So my reasoning is different, but we come to the same conclusion. Thank you, Bert. And that's, that's, uh, that actually comes back to, to a point we made before recording, which is maybe we need more economists to come and share their views on, on, on this debate, because I think it gives a very um, down-to-earth perspective, <laughs> let's say, to a very emotional debate. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope that I'll have the opportunity to read more of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. It was a pleasure to be in your podcast.